So, uh, welcome everybody to one of the last sessions of today. Uh, after this, there's just one roundup uh, discussion with all the uh, participants again. And I hope this time we can make it a little bit, we can open it up a little bit more to uh, also include you guys from the audience, guy, gr girls and guys, sorry, and gender neutrals. So, um, what we have here now is uh, a panel or, or a, a conversation, I should say, with uh, the illustri illustrious title um, Utopias Then and Now. Apparently this was a, that kind of uh, title which doesn't um, really uh, cover the topic precisely, but uh, we're going to talk about something that sort of touches on it. So, um, Without further ado, let me introduce to you Garnet Hertz, artist and uh, teacher at an art academy where? Uh, in Vancouver, Canada. In Vancouver, Canada. And of course, Ger Loving, who you have already met. Um, what did you guys want to talk about? That's a good question. So what I want to talk about is, um, and I think that's, that I've taken out of looking at McLuhan and being, uh, I mean, I was never any big McLuhan scholar, but I did a PhD work in film and media studies. And um, the thing that I take away from McLuhan is the, um, the creativity with uh, expanding and moving between writing and practice. Now in the case of McLuhan, it was much more of this type of graphic layout and experimenting with arguments through diagrams, with illustrations, with cu cut and paste, uh, and in some ways sort of a zine type of feel. Uh, also with playing cards and other ways. So the way that I'm interested in continuing this is that um, in my own work, I had grown up as a net artist and making robotics, telerobotics, had made uh, different kind of machines, electromechanical art, installation. Um, and I ended up being dissatisfied over the type of writing that I saw happening in electronic and media arts. And I felt a burden to go and uh, to write, to, to learn how to write so I could be sort of a voice on the inside to try to represent what I saw was happening in this work. So um, in my work, I'm interested in, uh, lately I published a zine called Disobedient Electronics uh, looking at, and it's a curated collection of artists and activists and uh, through several different regions and several diff different disciplines that uses uh, electronic art and industrial design to make political statements. Uh, at the same time, I'm very interested in uh, DIY and maker culture. And initially it was sort of just getting tired of people with 3D printers um, making stupid crap, you know? Uh, and and uh, the, calibrating your 3D printer and getting it to work really well is good and, and interesting as a process in itself, but then you come into a problem where what are you gonna make, okay? And, and this is a problem with, you know, because we're at an art school uh, and, I, and I work at one, you know, what are you gonna build? Uh, what are you going to create? So um, I've latched on to and tried to expand this term of critical making as a comment into the idea of maker culture, where it's like, okay, 3D printers are great, the Arduino is great, but, and it's like, now we're all makers. But if you go to an art school, it's one big maker space, you know? These people have been practicing sculpture forever and understanding the made thing. So my point with that critical making project was to say, look, maker 
uh, you know, Arduino and 3D printer crowd, you can really learn a lot by, by going and looking at how design and art have been through these things before, many, many times before. And there's a rich heritage of a lot of different terms, critical technical practice, adversarial design, critical design, uh, tactical media, you know, all the rest of this stuff that, that can really help understand and, and give us a solution to what we should build. Um, and, and to sort of move beyond just, oh, I'm a maker, into, well, what are you making it for? So that's where I'm coming can I, from. Can I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised because um, uh, we, had a, we had a deal here among us, uh, us three. Uh, you would uh, introduce the topic of conversation, which I haven't heard yet. Um, and, and then um, you would talk about where it came from. Uh, so the topic of conversation, I will just Critical disclose making. it. Is, is, that. No, uh, huh? that huh? What you said before was how to uh, change the art academy. And yes. now you're talking about yes. changing maker culture, which is a different topic. Well, the, I think the two, not. the two are very yeah. intertwined. Yeah. yeah. I think there is something important about the, I mean, what, what I think I want to kind of get across and start a discussion about is how to um, deploy this work. What is maybe, you know, put differently, what does McLuhan mean to your practice? You know, what do you take away from this and what do you build? And so I'm, and so I see uh, the, this concept of, of combining uh, theory and practice, it's not a, something new, and I've latched onto this brand of critical making a, as, a, as a term to kind of bring that together, um, but I think it's, it is very useful in an institution, in spaces where there are, you know, there's a kind of a, maybe a battle between theory classes and studio classes, and it, it's, I see it as a way to try to maybe bring those in, in more conversation together. Maybe I could uh, step in here. Um, I have a somewhat different uh, way to get at the same point because uh, Garnet and I, we have uh, yeah, been corresponding uh, over the years and really uh, it's quite clear that uh, what we're talking about here, we, things are coming uh, together. Uh, obviously, uh, when you're coming from the media, media activism side, um, you're not primarily focused on um, making. You, you can have a materialist uh, worldview, you can um, look at uh, you know, media as something that's very material. Uh, it's not, it's infrastructure, it's, you, you have to, it's equipment, uh, tools, you need to uh, have skills, you meet, need to master uh, the, the technology, if you, if you like, if you... If you knowledge, knowledge, historical oh, knowledge, absolutely. she was talking yes. about that. Uh, so there's all that, uh, so the, the virtuality of it uh, is... Uh, is, is quickly overcome once you uh, get your hands dirty with media, right? This sounds a bit uh, weird, but this has been the experience uh, for the last 20 years. Now, um, there is, of course, when we look at it from the institutional perspective, there's a whole other um, uh, thing going on. Um, and that is, of course, that uh, at least the schools in which I am um, working and uh, visiting, uh, a lot of them um, want to get rid of classrooms, want to get rid of libraries, want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, only have uh, kind of a, a few desks that you share, right? All that stuff, which we could say is some kind of neoliberal virtualization of the educational space. And this is really, really happening. Okay, one story. Like yesterday, I was visiting a MBO school in Amsterdam, which is giving middle, graphic... Middle level Yeah, middle level, level vocational level. training to really young young people in the, in the graphic uh, area, right? So which includes both graphic design and 
print or what's left of it. Right? And what was very, very interesting that I, I saw there, precisely what we're talking about here, right? So this goes even way beyond, let's say, the, the ghetto of the art school. Because what was Could you going be a bit on? More specific? Yeah, what was going on? They had just reintroduced the classes for drawing. Yeah? They had uh, gotten rid of all the paper. They had, of course, they had got rid of all the, the printing machines and so on and so on, right? And now they felt terribly at a loss. Now, Florian Kramer, he has uh, written extensively about you know, the kind of post-digital art, right? And the, the whole idea of the post-digital. And there I saw that idea at work, really, where, uh, and this was not I have to say this was not done out of nostalgic reasons, right? This was done out of necessity. And the necessity came from the firms uh, in which these MBO schools are so tightly uh, working together with, right? So this was a feedback that came from the firms which said, your students have to go back to the drawing uh, classes, and so on and so on, right? Very, very interesting uh, shift. To do what exactly? to uh, work with their hands, first and foremost, right? In all sorts of different uh, shapes. Um, and maybe even, you know, get to the point again, to what you just said, you know, making, make, make stuff. Huh? Uh, so we have gone through a process of, let's say, neoliberal flexibilization uh, and digitization, which, which was uh, defined in a completely wrong uh, way. And now we're uh, into the critical making, which I see as a, you know, as, as, a, as a method to also speed up the question, you know, what, uh, what should be general uh, education uh, be uh, about in this, in this age uh, of the computer networks and uh, the digital, right? So we're talking here about something which you, are, I think, already um, uh, quite convincingly uh, put here up the table. We're really talking about something that goes beyond the 3D printer and uh, you know all the silly things you can make with that. Well, when Garnet uh, told us about uh, this this lack of knowledge in maker culture with uh, art historical practice. Or, or different kinds of practices that have that existed existed apparently in uh, art schools. Uh, I was reminded of uh, something that I uh, bump into occasionally in art institutions, uh, or which actually surprises me uh, is that um, when it come uh, so so you go to a big museum, modern art museum, or you, you deal with some other like high level art institution and uh, they have rich traditions, uh, you know, they have uh, shown conceptual art, they've shown performance art, they've shown uh, installations, arts, uh, all kinds of things, um, sound art, you name it. And then the computer comes in and all they are able to show is post-internet glam images as, as a representation of what you can do with these new technologies. And uh, it's, it, it really surprises me as if, you know, that, that these professionals that are so articulate, that know so much about the 20th century art uh, from the situation, it's, you name it, fluxes, everything. And then when the computer comes into the classroom, yeah. all they can think Silent. about is creative industries mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> in a very flat way. So uh, that is a problem and how do you tackle that? Do you have an idea for that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one term that I like to use to think about uh, this sort of thing, kind of being uh, drawn into a new medium, uh, and this is a term by Raphael Lozano Hammer that he wrote a long time ago when he used to write or no, be known as a curator, is the idea of the effect effect. It's like when a new special effect comes out, you, like if some 3D app comes out and it can render hair, then everything has hair, you know? It's all over the top. Yeah. Or when everything, you know, when the 3D printer comes out and you can 3D print stuff, everything is 3D printed. 
You know, and, and the, there's a natural tendency to do that, is to get caught up in the special effect of the new, new medium. Which but, now would be VR and AR? Sure. And, uh, well, VR and AR are a different thing. Uh, and interesting, too, because they've come up from the dead like a zombie uh, and, and seeing a second life. You know, it's been the second coming of virtual reality um, from the 1990s. Um, so I think that, uh, I think that effect effect is, uh, something that is going to happen, but I, I do see it, I do see it coming back. How can we get beyond back. that? That's the question, well, of I, course. Well, I think, I think there's a couple of different strategies. I mean, I think artists are generally quite good at looking back at older forms of communication and older type of media and tools and experimenting around with stuff and reviving that stuff and I, and and i think that the best even if so even if you're making uh focused on making youtube videos or uh whatever your type of practice you're doing people are still heavily involved in making physical artifacts that go into those videos and uh so i think i mean one one way that i've thought about this in the past with uh, UC Parika was we called it the zombie type of media that, that and coming back to the dead media project that, that uh, was referred to in the past, um, I think one strategy is to pull, pull up from the past and to know that history and, and know those technologies and not like you just need to treat media studies as a uh, cheat sheet for what you can do, but it works really, really fantastic. And in rediscovering those old forms of technology, you can really come up with some wonderful type of work because there, there is an attraction to things like vinyl, you know? You see vinyl apparently outpacing uh, streamed music in terms of revenue, you know? Um, strange and weird things that I think that artists need to pay attention to and um, is a really good resource for ideas, is, is out of the historical. However... What, what, what is final is? What is a good resource for ideas? Um, is going back into history and looking at uh, tools and technologies of the past to, as a resource for, for rethinking the present. Yeah. So are you saying basically that uh, these art institutions that I was talking about, or the professionals that I was talking about, uh, they need to learn about this media archaeological history. They need to learn more about technology, about tools, about, you know, have a, have a more of a deconstructivist view of it? Well, I, th I, think, I think that it's a strategy that can be taken with media history, is that artists can read and understand that work as a source of inspiration for their own projects. It doesn't need to, that's not like there needs to be, that's the only purpose to learn history or, or theory, but it's definitely a good, a good starting point, yeah, I think. I would move this discussion a little bit away, you know, f from the very specific concerns you can have about uh, not well-educated um, curators and critics in the digital domain, because they are not. And obviously, we need to uh, you know, train the young generation in a different way so that this problem uh, uh, cannot be, yeah, will not be happening. In the meanwhile, these people are in charge, and that's unfortunate, but uh, um, <clears throat> that's um, uh, this situation. I look at it uh, from a bit broader uh, uh, perspective of training a, a, an enormous diverse uh, group of, uh, of professionals in the artistic creative field, in the IT field, where the two have uh, already uh, merged, and in, in, uh, which is a field in which uh, making uh, is becoming uh, integrated, where, let's say, the, uh, the dialectics, the, 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 the synthesis of the, what was in the past called the real and the virtual has long been made, right? And this is now 
uh, the digital is now a material culture for the masses, and this is really a lift, a reality, right? And anyone who who, who still dreams of uh, some, you know, far away uh, cyberspace, whatever, yeah, uh, is is not is not well informed and is. Uh, really of the of the past and so this the critical making uh, as a as a new approach as a as a school as an emerging uh, movement can really uh, also i think when we look at it from the McLuhan perspective can also make grandiose new speculative gestures and this is really important um, why because um, otherwise we might get a little bit too much in the, in the nostalgic retro mood, right? So what you say is to get to know the older technologies is absolutely important, right? This is really, really important. But we don't do that from a nostalgic uh, point of view, like uh, as, a, as a form of resignation, right? Uh, yeah. No, it's about understanding uh, where the technologies that we yeah. use today come yeah, from. And we need to but go, I we think go you're, through you're bringing the whole up Heidegger debate, we need to talk I'm about... I'm moderator. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the, the, the culture for the masses, you brought, uh, you brought yeah. up the culture for the masses. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting because uh, that's something that you left out. So, you're talking very much about the materialistic part of it. But uh, what it does, these new technologies, is also break open uh, in, in a... In a uh, almost physical way, uh, the, the walls of the institution. So all the things that past art movements have tried to do, huh? you know, forget art in public space, this is way beyond that. Huh? So uh, I find it really, I, I would like to know if you have any ideas of, you know, how an art school could deal with these things, how they could implement uh, these, this culture for the masses, what it means to teach in an art school, uh, what it means for the position of the art school. Do you have any ideas of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, coming back to draw on this idea of making, I mean, I'm not... Uh, I think making as a term, it's not like this term is going to save us, but I think it has some, some uh, merit uh, I think it's rather uh, gender inclusive as opposed to a term like hacking, which I think is sort of branded quite uh, yeah. male oriented, I think of. Um, and I think making has an interesting place that almost disregards disciplines of art or design. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't call myself a uh, maker, you know, I kind of don't like when people say, I'm a maker, but I do really, I have a lab called the Studio for Critical Making, so I really, am, I do really embrace that, uh, that label, but I think the decision to uh, have art separated into one category of the white cube and have it, um, probing and asking questions and to have design on this side and to have it solving problems for clients, for example, uh, uh, case studies and all the rest of this stuff. Um, I think those distinctions are, are a bit difficult. And I mean, I think anybody in, in art or design that engages and thinks about it, knows that good design can really ask questions, you know. And I think that good, good art solves problems. And it's not, th those terms are both, both really good, but in terms of the institution, I think that um, those areas circulate in their own kind of worlds and it would be useful. And, and I think in terms of making, I mean, hacker spaces are interesting places where these things come together in the form of tools, people from disciplines coming in to work on different projects together and being exposed to each other. And I think at the moment when you build something as an artifact that can work, that people can see it operate, that you can maybe put it out on the street or show it to your friends or, or put it out in, in public sphere, 
that it almost has its own, not like it has its agency, but it, it has some legs to it that it can go and it can link up those different disciplines in, in different ways. So I think the built object, and I, th and I think that that's, that's maybe a problem with um, a term like critical design that, uh, and I'm a fan of a lot of that work, but um, critical design, the, in terms of- Are you also of, talking about critical engineering here in this context, or the critical engineer, the Julian Oliver Danya Vasiliev uh, yeah, manif yeah. manifesto? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm referring to Dunn and Raby at Royal College of Art. I think uh, with a quite strict insistence that it's not art. Um, I think I think that's a bit uh, problematic and uh, not really correct because the work circulates in galleries and and so forth. But that's another but, topic. Yeah. What, what I notice right now uh, is that uh, this discussion that you now bring up, it's actually ancient, yeah. you know? Yeah. This, this is not new no. at all, but it seems as if, uh, well, the, the digital times, let's just very simplify, the, uh, simplify it, um, have sort of thrown us back uh, and, and made that division bigger again, you know, between but art and can design. Can I say something about this? Thrown yes. us back for, for a reason, you know? We are thrown back in the, if you like, in the pre-industrial age. You know, unfortunately, uh, you can also call it post-industrial age. You know, the problem is uh, one of, uh, you know, the mass manufacturing is happening elsewhere. And, um, uh, you know, is, is uh, what, what forms of manufacturing, um, uh, you know, do we have, uh, have in mind for us, for our students, for the next uh, generation here in Europe, right? This is really what's uh, on the agenda. And within that new form uh, of manufacturing, or the, what some call, you know, the digital factory, what is the digital factory? Uh, well, um, there uh, we have to uh, ask, you know, and what is the role of uh, art and design in that n a digital factory? And then. There's one school that looks at the working conditions, which looks at the precariousness of, uh, of uh, the designers and, and the position in society. But the other is much more speculative, and that's maybe what you uh, do. And it looks at um, actual, actual work uh, with the new materials. And you are right to say that uh, we've been there before, and this is arts and craft, it's a uh, Bauhaus, and um, yes, we are there. And remember, in the Bauhaus, you would have a class on materials. Well, I can really, uh, base in, the, in the first year, right? You would have a, a class on, on the nature of the, of the materials. Now, we, it's so easy to do that these days, you know, in, in our new uh, environment, and to completely rethink that class on you know, the basic knowledge of, uh, of materials. I, and that, that, of course, would include uh, digital material, all, all the, everything, um, including the new materials, of course. Um, yeah, so um, uh, there's a lot uh, that can be done also in that, in my view, more speculative and experimental level. Uh, can, can, I, can I chime in again? Yeah. Um, so um, we're talking about practical decisions that have to be made within art schools. We're talking about, you know, what, how art schools have to change or if, you know, transform, maybe better uh, term. Um, and uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking, reminded of uh, uh, something that Mackenzie Wark wrote in the Hacker Manifesto, uh, which probably comes from someone else, well, education is slavery. Um, what people learn in art schools, and especially when it comes to dealing with these tools that are, uh, you know, uh, that we're discussing here, is they are trained to work in very bland forms of creative industry. Yeah? So that, how can we change the mindset for that? Yeah? How can, uh, I think that's the issue, because you can say we will change the art schools, but they still have to educate the students for a particular environment. Uh, so the environment has to change as well, or they, 
they will have to, you will also have to, if you change this art school, have some sort of, give, give them some sort of tools to deal with this, but well, maybe hostile environment. Yeah, but that's perfectly doable. Look at uh, the field of digital publishing here in the Netherlands. Uh, we are trying to um, make a difference there. We have uh, three schools, Arnhem, Arne, Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Uh, we try to work together to make a new curriculum uh, in that particular field, right? In, in, in which we say the hybrid uh, is the default and uh, digital publishing uh, is, is, a, is a new diverse uh, field and, and, and set, of, uh, set of skills. And we want uh, the next generation of people who are going to work in that field uh, to be fully aware uh, of that. We don't want uh, to uh, only um, uh, give them the idea, yeah, print is something nostalgic, or yes, print is something where you sit on the, uh, after, behind the computer the whole day, right? These are two stereotypes that do not work, just as an example, right? Do you have an example as well, Garnet? Of a practical... Uh... Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think one strategy to um, to pull this forward is to um, think about spaces that are within an arts art and design school that are interested in exploring topics of uh, sustainability, of uh, material exploration, of uh, critical design. You know that. Uh, actually, critical design isn't a good topic. Uh, privacy, perhaps, that can um, come together and pull people into different clusters in art schools. And often, often you don't necessarily have those type of initiatives uh, because people are are more circulating in their own own disciplines. But I think starting up centers and having units, and sometimes it can be around a studio model, like a maker lab, or, uh, you know, if there's a, um, sort of a curated direction to those spaces, I think there can be a lot that can be done to bring those fields together. Would you say that there's an element in there of a multidisciplinary project uh, approach, where you really sure. bring together yeah. uh, different uh, backgrounds? Sure, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I think there's something to be said for uh, individuals trying to take on, um, you know, learning how to program, reading all this McLuhan, and now you have to read all this Adorno, and then Horkheimer, and then you have to go learn uh, how to use a CNC machine and a 3D printer. I mean, the I think a lot can be done when people take that on and try to incorporate that all into themselves, but we often don't, often the idea of a team is something, or a space and a group is something that is really uh, effective, so. If, if, if I can give a, a small example that I've already shared with uh, someone else in this room uh, earlier. Uh, I, I go the tour of the KBK once a few years ago two years ago or something. And uh, one of the things they showed us was the printer room, which has an amazing amount of uh, printers, sand printers, uh, uh, laser cutters, uh, plastic printers, uh, you, know, you name it. And um, then I asked the technician there, um, you know, how it, how it works, how, how students work with it. And he says, well, the students make a plan, that they, they have an idea and they come to me and I help them to make it. And I said, you help them, you're the technician, you help them to make it. And you know, what's, what's the involvement of the teachers? None. Mm -hmm. There was no yeah. involvement of the teachers in yeah. this process, which is completely <laughs> stunning. Yeah. You know, yeah. so uh, a lot they, of the they teaching, don't A lot engage. of teaching has gone onto the shoulders of lab technicians. Um, I mean, I think that's a problem across many campuses, is that you go... Uh, right, right. Can we have a microphone in the room? Because uh, I, I think it's a good, yeah, maybe yeah, a good yeah. idea to have some experiences from the room or uh, ideas responses. from the room. Responses. 
Yeah. Maybe you're not, uh, you don't I mean, agree it, it, at all that, that, that yeah. there is a problem, that's also a possibility. Uh, let me just explain, this is everywhere, practically in every art and design school uh, of the world, and it's actually, you could say, a perversion of the Bauhaus curriculum. Because the, the Bauhaus curriculum was about the integration of material study and workshop study uh, and, and then general um, uh, design or art study. Uh, and the way this was then um, uh, effectuated or adapted to practically every art and design school in the world, doesn't matter whether you're in Brazil or in the Netherlands, is um, that you have the, the course teachers and you have the workshop teachers. Uh, and they even in the Netherlands are on two different salary levels. Uh, yeah. uh, it normally means a workshop teacher, the, uh, um, the, the, the one who Werkplatz do, do sent, uh, is on salary level 9 and, and a teacher is on salary uh, level uh, 11. Uh, and this is, and, and it's, it's really a kind of platonic divide. Uh, so in the courses we, we keep ourselves busy with the concepts and in the workshop uh, we kind of uh, translate these concepts into, into physical things. And, and this is separated on the level. Uh, I don't want to make propaganda, but my school made a first effort of changing that, but uh, I, I keep yeah. my mouth shut. So, so, so here we have yeah. the, pr yeah. the, the reason yeah. why there is no knowledge of art historical uh, precedences in this area. But, well, unless the, 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 the lab techie is art historically schooled or yes. uh, has any major knowledge of the art world, I would say that, you know, that and, and maybe I could, could also add, and then Shiloh takes over, this is also the reason why, let's say, for example, so-called media art has been looked upon with a scorn. Because that was the kind of stuff that the, the lab technicians did, but not the, 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 the conceptual teachers. You know? It was like the dirty work. You want to Sorry. chime in? Anybody? Anybody else chime in? Yeah. Hi. Um, this is a um, lot, lot of conversation, but just two, two brief points to interject here. First of all, when we talk about uh, the, the, the maker culture and the problems arising in arts institutions, I think it's really interesting to go back to McLuhan and there's this little quote that he, um, he phrases, which is, uh, we make our tools and then our tools make us. So there's this discursive relationship between the tools available and then when you use them, it shapes you, whether it's theoretical tools or a 3D printer or a printing machine. It also becomes the constraints of how you can think about the world. You can only think of what's possible to create with the limitations of the tools available to you. In this sense, the way I see it in education, one of the exciting opportunities is exposing people to a variety of tools, but also uh, uh, being aware of how that restricts our thinking and our Capabilities. So, and then I wonder, not only looking back, but looking forward, what potential do we have in the tools that's not being used yet? And I would not like to abandon the term hacking completely, even though I am a woman. <laughs> um, uh, just to re I mean, said there is this, this, this um, you know, hacking tools is part of the potential of an art school to say, all right, what corporation design can we use differently? Uh, what other things can we use differently? Yeah, that's... Yeah, I think... Um, I mean, one of the, the things, if you think about hacker culture kind of morphing into maker culture, uh, I think it gets quite depoliticized, you know, in the process. D, uh, you know, it's almost family-friendly, you know, and it's very, very uh, general. It's so general, I mean, that's why it works and that's why that term is spread, uh, because it doesn't offend anybody. And I, and I think, coming back to the future, I mean, it, it's so important, I think, for artists and designers to understand that, that you have a responsibility um, and you have a great weight to things that you're building, especially designers that um, everything that you design has an implication to it, you know? You're making an argument with, whether you know it or not, with how you manufacture something, how you put it together, who you in include, who you exclude. Uh, so you may just be designing a toothbrush for Colgate or something, you know, after you get a job in industrial design, but, you know, how you shape that, if you, 
you know, how you design that is, is a political kind of process. And I think, I think that's uh, important understanding that uh, artists and designers, I think, need to be looking out in the, into the future and be um, charting the path, you know? Being the um, sort of the distant early warning, uh, which McLuhan had used to, to and there was a, a row of, of uh, satellite dishes that were across the Arctic of Canada, and this dew line, or distant early warning line, was built across the Arctic, and it's a Cold War thing, which maybe we're entering into another Cold War, I'm not sure, but um, of the artists acting as almost an interceptor of that, of that war and understander of, of that process that's happening. And that's a, that's a big responsibility. Um, and it's difficult and it's hard for artists to, and designers to respond to that work, but there are a lot of examples through history of really inspirational type of projects that we can learn from uh, that kind of show, give us hope and uh, show us that that can be done. Uh, I'm just looking at the organizers here for how much time we have, because we started way too late. I think 15 minutes too late. This bet, okay, yeah. so. Uh, yeah, we have some time, so uh, we, can, we can develop a bit more. I know uh, uh, Hirat has to leave pretty soon, but um, I, I'd be interested to hear both what uh, you, you are uh, thinking about. I have a couple of questions. Um, so we make our tools and then our, sh our tools Make uh, shape. Uh, we make our t shape our tools, and our then our tools shape us. Of course, technological determinist in some way, but uh, it's also clear that certain paradigms that uh, were uh, important when we when the tools emerged form the society, how we react to them. Do you ever get frustrated, like that you used to make? Uh, that you you ever get frustrated that when when you have um, that you're encountering tools that you you don't get to design the paradigmatic tools. That somehow the paradigmatic tools, like what a maker bot, you know, is, or a television or whatever, a cell phone, is like, that's, that's the realm of, of large scale industrial decisions. Mm -hmm. And that, that whether that critical making can, can intervene there, is it a response to that? Is there like hope that, you know, we can somehow reclaim uh, the industrial uh, genesis of new tools? And then the second yeah. question, yeah, uh, I don't know if that's good, but yeah, it's about the, the, the here in, in, in Holland, of course, you have uh, uh, this, this crisis about like uh, the, uh, the um, what's it called, the uh, cultural industries and the arts, right? And so like, it seems like you wanna like kind of filter out uh, some kind of critical side or humanities side of the arts and produce some kind of industry friendly uh, mm -hmm cultural industries stuff, which is like, so it's the, the art school is no longer like this waste of money or this waste of resources, but it's actually gonna produce competitive products for whatever, Holland or Europe to assert itself on the, on the world scale uh, in, in an industrial way. Um, do you see it like that? Do you see it like that? Okay. I I don't think uh, in the Netherlands we can say that uh, the, the current uh, movement uh, to, you know, work in, in the context of maker labs, uh, um, you know, is 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 countering the creative industry uh, policy. That's true, and that's why um, you know I've I've teamed up with Garner to uh, f because this critical maker. Uh, initiative is is a very clear and uh, a political statement uh, and is an absolute uh, provocation and intervention. I can tell you in our school it is. Huh? Uh, so uh, w once you come up with this uh, with this uh, story, people get really nervous and and upset because yes, you are uh, disturbing that uh, smooth uh, uh, new liberal agenda. That's absolutely uh, uh, correct. Now. The, the, the other question is harder to answer because if you do that, do you make a statement about you know, the autonomy of the arts? You don't. 
And, and that is true. And, and there, you, I, 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 you know, you are right. Um, you, you are, you're not operating there in that specific uh, context or uh, debate. In that sense, maybe the critical making is really focused on more vocational uh, design focused um, uh, provocations and interventions in this uh, much larger uh, debate in society how we are going to make a living in the 21st century uh, in Europe. Um, how are we going to, uh, do we really uh, agree with that uh, there's only a, the, the small workshop that is left, the, the singular uh, precarious uh, individual ZZP worker, is that really our idea? Can we uh, think up larger uh, co-ops, larger uh, context in, we, in which we can live and work? You know, I think we should. And. Um, uh, if that's going to be called the digital factory or manufacturing or something, some larger uh, design for society, so be it. And if that does not answer the, the difficult question of autonomy in the arts, so be it. And I think the, the, um, the confrontational idea, like coming back to uh, digital industries or what was the term that you used, digital... Creative industries. Uh, that's how it's called here. Creative culture. Yeah, creative industries. I think that um, I think that you have uh, the ability to. Uh, I lost my train of thought for a second. I think the creative industries. I think that you can uh, have something like uh, you can do things in critical and provocative ways and teach people those tools and they may take that and carry on and, and do some standard commercial job for a while. But I think coming back to, I think the, the key thing to, to think about that's maybe missing from those industry oriented thing is what does it mean to be a human? You know, what does it mean to be a person, right? And, and this is something that, this is something that the humanities really is, is a, it's one, it's a big topic within, or you could even say it, it is the humanities. What does it mean to be a human? And, and it's something that industry will always kind of lack, you know, they're, because they're focused on making products. And so I think that's one way that, that the arts can, um, and humanities can, can come and really push that question, what does it mean to be a human and what does it mean to be a society, you know? It's, it's a that's a really tough question. You end up, you know, staring in a mirror at three in the morning, uh, totally drunk and sort of saying like, what am I doing with my life? You know, and, and, that, and that's how the arts, and that's how this different theory can really mobilize and make something interesting out of uh, cultural industries. May I try to, to add something to, to your thought? Um, I also think that uh, ever since, well, we had this slide projected in the early morning, ever since Adorno and Horkheimer's uh, critique of the cultural uh, industries, we are basically, we were left at least in their theory with almost two impossible alternatives. Uh, namely, the one was either you're Hollywood or you're Arnold Schoenberg. There's almost nothing in between. Or, or uh, if you are uh, 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 Arnold Schoenberg, then you don't get your hands dirty. You have to find some, some way out of the, uh, let's say, uh, outside the economic system or you, you, you have to depend on the public uh, art system. Um, or you are a slave to the creative industries. Now, for, my, for me, the, the, the question, maybe even the promise of critical making is, how do we get out of this deadly black and white uh, 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 thinking that we say, actually, no, there is an economic side uh, to being an artist. You cannot just push it aside by, by saying, oh, you're a capitalist and you're evil uh, as, as soon as you are... Uh, earning your money with being an artist and having to survive in, in that system. But that doesn't mean that in the moment where, where you have to, uh, to work in 
industrial context that you're giving up your criticality. How can you, how can you bring this uh, together? And not as a kind of lame compromise, but it can also be in the forms of ill infiltration, uh, rethinking, also rethinking of economic models. You know, what, what are your own economic models as, as, an, as an artist? So, uh, for example, what could be a commons model for, for, for composers of atonal music uh, uh, to, to think up one way? And then, if you go that far, then I think critical making can also be its opposite, um, namely critical unmaking, yeah? like unmaking of existing structures. And then it's not necessarily um, uh, uh, linked to technology or the question, do I have a CNC or a 3D printer here? But to give one contemporary example here from the Netherlands, I would say the process that um, um, the Witte de Witt contemporary, uh, Center of Contemporary Art now is going through in, in, in Rotterdam where they're switching their names because the, uh, the name Witte de Witt is, is associated to, to Dutch colonialism, which was a result of um, an um, uh, anti-colonialist artist project in the house where several people, several activists, um, uh, refused to participate because he, they said, as long as you have that name, we will not participate. Um, so, um, and that meant for, uh, that actually, Witte de Witt had to do something. There was a process of critical unmaking or remaking the institution and saying, well, we're not just uh, uh, displaying post-colonial or anti-colonial art, well, actually, we have to decolonize our institution as well. And if, if that process you know, has any meaning, then it also means that it will not just be a name change, but it has to be a complete redefinition of what, what an institute of contemporary art is in, 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 in the 21st century. So, that's my question, you know, is, is that, Garnet, would you agree that this is the larger horizon of critical making that transcends the question of, of art, design and technology? Maybe I'm asking too much. <laughs> the answer is yes. I'm asking too much. Oh, no, no, I, I'm not, no. Well, yes, yes, that was a little bit long. That was a little bit long-winded, but uh, in general, yes. I know I'm answering you. Uh, uh, Yes, I think, I, th I mean, I would like to see the, the term um, develop and be matured around uh, different strategies and how to deploy that, you know, and how to enact that. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that front. Um, can we have one final comment here or question or you want to keep going? Yeah? I thought we were to end at 6.15, no? Okay. Um, yeah, well, what, what I find striking at the, the, the start of the discussion, there was this implicit idea of the work of art being this thingy, this... Whereas I think that, especially when, uh, what I think the last remark of uh, Florian touches upon, is very much the structural embedding that grants the societal label of either art or design or whatever. So it, it, is, it, it is this point of view that, that I find really difficult to follow you because as a teacher myself, I have a totally different approach to this uh, because even if uh, uh, the Bauhaus is still, uh, let's say, a, a legacy in the Rietveld Academy, all the departments, although the departments have remained more or less the same, um, they've changed completely from the inside out. So there is no genuine, old-fashioned, craft-oriented way of making art. Uh, the whole idea in which these crafts have developed it themselves and have some kind of societal visibility or appearance or the practices surrounding these practices have totally disappeared or changed. Yeah. So that is the problematics that there is basically no, nothing to compare with. There is only practice. And this practice is sometimes within the artistic field. So when you say, well, I do not consider that to be art, well, I have the, I have this, the idea that luckily so. I mean, because I think that that is ex uh, exactly the type of legacy that, that McLuhan was pointing at, that everything is art in the sense that everything has rendered itself uh, to this artificial, discursive way of dealing with their own practice and making of meaning. 
uh, it is very much uh, the idea of Martin Creed having uh, the slogan, one of his works, I think, 103, uh, in which he said, uh, the whole world plus the work is the whole world, which means, fuck you. Uh, and that makes it only com more complex, I, I agree. I do not particularly like Martin Creed, by the way. Uh, but nevertheless, this explains or uh, uh, makes clear what the type of problematics is that as soon as you start talking about the institution of the art school, and you cannot basically deal it with, I think, old-fashioned terms. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, hey. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about where uh, critical making is situated within the kind of other critical practices we've, we've seen, because we have actually haven't heard that much about what critical making is all about. So I mean, like, you know, there's plenty of others. You, you mentioned critical engineering, which is kind of all about, all about uh, uh, disclosing of threats by way of exploits. You know, we have uh, electronic civil disobedience, which is all about using like the virtual sit-in and using the electronics, using like uh, the internet as a means of attack, uh, as a means of a many-to-one kind of attack. And, uh, but I think perhaps even closer, uh, we have Ernesto Oroza's idea of technological disobedience, right? Because um, uh, uh, Oroza starts his work uh, by demonstrating like a lot of, and his work consists mostly of showing how technology is used in Cuba, where the Cuban revolution, um, sorry, the Cuban embargo has uh, prevented um, technolo much technology to be imported into Cuba for, for many, many years. And so, and so um, the Cuban people uh, have created very creative ways of, uh, of dealing with that and using parts of, you know, washing machines to fix their car or whatever. That's a random example, but uh, uh, Rosa has, has a lot of them. And so this concept of technological disobedience, I think, is, is, very, is very interesting um, to maker culture because, you know, it emphasizes post-consumer creativity, whereas in maker culture, it often, often uh, emphasizes consumer creativity. So you're buying Arduinos, you're buying like coils of this like plastic goo, and you don't ask, where does this Arduino come from? What is the industrial process that has made this Arduino? Where does this goo come from? What's the environmental impact of creating a bunch of goo in order to make like, you know, like a shot glass out of plastic with a, with a, with a maker machine? So um, I'd love to know where critical making is situated in that kind of spectrum of responses. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I mean, for myself, um, Matt Ratto had come up with a term uh, at University of Toronto, coming out of a um, almost like a information studies kind of perspective, where he understood it as um, that using hands-on tools is useful in studying something like information science or information studies. So, for example, if you're studying copyright, that instead of just theorizing about how something works, that, that uh, theorists and uh, scholars should get their hands dirty and workshopping out to see how uh, things work. And that you can learn things that way, in a way that, uh, that's not just by thinking about it. So, in Matt's concept of it, I see it as primarily a workshop mode for uh, scholars, okay? Um, my interest in, in using the term was to take it, so I, I, I see Matt as coming from uh, almost literature into building, where in my background building work, I'm more interested in coming from the other direction where I'm interested in taking something like maker culture, 3D printers, and this sort of thing, and having done stuff in the early 1990s with electronics and have carried on since then, you know, am kind of shaking my head at some of this stuff and going like, hey, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff that's been written about this and there's a lot of ways to get informed about this. So I see Mattis coming from uh, literature, coming into making. I see myself as coming from making and pulling those makers to, as an appeal to the maker community to be more engaged with that history, theory, uh, humanities, okay? So 
And it's a term that's used by different people, but, but for sure, it, it definitely relates to things f for myself. There's several different brands that different authors have done. Carl DeSalvo with adversarial design, uh, tactical media, um, you have uh, critical technical practice, uh, Phil Agre, um, uh, reflective design by Phoebe Sengers, uh, values in design by Helen Nissenbaum, um, different disciplines, and, and to some degree, uh, critical design by Dunn and Raby at Royal, Co formerly of Royal College of Art, now from Parsons. Um, these things are, and also critical engineering, you know, is is very very close to each other. You know, they're, these are circulating. They're they're different in different ways, but they're all basically saying like. The technology is important, and what you're doing with it uh, is important, and you need to reflect on the values that you're embedding into your thing, because whether you acknowledge it or not, that built object ha makes an argument. So invest wisely in what you're building and thinking about, because you are really, um, you're involved in a political process when you're building something. There is a question in the back, or yeah, a remark. Uh, I, yes, um, I, I think we can agree that the economization of education is a serious problem, and uh, I think a lot of the things we're talking about here are, are related to that, a total de-appreciation of the humanities because you cannot put an econo economized or financial value on that. So I guess then, and these are, these are great ideas of a solution of how to ethically uh, you know, deal with with des questions of design and, and with art, but how do, we, how do we shape funding then to get those ideas into our universities? And how can we then collectively, I, I work in the, in the university, the Freie Universität of Amsterdam, we have the same problems with the university, especially in the art department. How, how do we then collectively get together with artists, uh, all of us, we're working with art, with design, to make a demand that these kind of ethical-natured problems need to be need to be a major priority within the Netherlands. I mean, we are, if we're of maker culture and we know how to express ideas through art, through different forms of media, how do we get that message out? So funding in the Netherlands for universities comes from the government, right? So you have to convince the government that there's somebody over there trying to... And actually, I one, I'll introduce a term while you're handing over the mic. Uh, in the Canadian system, um, the uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council was lobbied and changed the category to include something called a research creation um, that combined the arts and so social sciences. Um, it's actually quite an interesting anomaly, this idea of research creation within Canada and funding, that I think, that I think if people are looking for models to, uh, for political pressure or to uh, work, to, I mean, it's not perfect, but work towards something, it's an interesting model. I feel uh, obliged to grab the mic again uh, for the simple reason that I'm one next to Shiloh and uh, Yannick, who's uh, no longer here, and, and others, a representative actually of an NBO-funded project, Critical Making, that is running the next uh, four years with University Leiden. Your university, uh, no, you're at uh, Freie Universität, University Leiden, my school in Rotterdam, um, West Den Haag is part of this project as, as well. Um, I had New Year Institute and uh, De Waag, and we got, I mean, it's not much, but we, we, we got 400,000 euros uh, for that for, for the next couple of years. And what was struck me, we actually got this money from the Creative Industries uh, uh, Research Program. Um, and um, what really struck me when I looked at the, the kind of projects that were uh, submitted, um, uh, they, they were, let's say, obediently um, uh, compliant to, to uh, uh, creative industries expectations. Uh, yeah? I mean, we had the boldness uh, to just write, we want to do critical, uh, we want to do a four years research uh, program on critical making as an alternative to creative industries. We wrote this in the program and we got the money. 
Uh, I also know, <laughs> you know it's, yeah. it's, yeah, and, and yeah. don't under underestimate that, that, that in these institutions, the funding bodies, there are still people who are sympathetic to such causes because Josephine yeah. and I, we also happen to, to, to be in the jury of one of the sub-programs of the uh, Dutch Creative Industries Funds, which is actually for artists and designer projects. If you look at the, 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 the project that get money from that fund, then you will see that I think more than 50% of them would qualify as critical making. Um, so, uh, I think there also needs to be more, let's say, courage from the institutions yeah. to say, well, when there is such a call, and it's called smart culture industries, and it sounds like shit, well, you know, try to, yeah. to, to propose a good project. Yeah, have, have the, the courage. courage. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. Yeah, that's a good point. The courage to say no. Uh, to say no. Creative industries in this case, in the, in the Dutch uh, context. Yeah. But in the Canadian context, maybe it would be uh, something else. But hmm? mm -hmm. So, um, is there anything that you can, because uh, we, we, we're sort of going meta again, couple this back to the art school itself? Am I? I would just like to encourage all the students to uh, be bold in their work, to be confrontational in their work, to look for things that you think are wrong in the world and be brave in trying to address them, and to apply for money, because I guess it's there, even, even if it maybe doesn't appear like it's there. You know, publish your own projects, cobble together what you can and, and uh, to try to proceed and try to not let, try to stay focused on, on using your skills to make the world a better place. I mean, this, uh, sorry, this is starting to sound like a TED talk. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> that, that would be my advice. Yeah. Yeah, I would say um, that there is a real existing pressure uh, to put uh, your output in uh, existing models. Uh, in, and in my uh, context, that's, for instance, the app. Uh, everything needs to be an app. It's a very uh, uh, known uh, example of... Uh, uh, of an output that uh, can be uh, can be recognized, etc. Right. So, um, if we introduce there at, at that very moment this uh, idea of critical unmaking, uh, the questioning, taking it apart, uh, th that is a, a very very important um, first step to resist that. Uh, uh, yeah, obligation that is out there uh, to uh, use uh, the existing formats to uh, question question the protocols, question the interfaces, question uh, the, the design, the, and this is uh, you know how the critical making uh, will uh, will start. So it's also about being sort of disobedient to your teachers in a way. If you say uh, they're all pushed towards making apps? Yeah, I think so. Uh, that's I think if you're doing good work, that if you're in a class where the assignment is to make an app, and if you're, I mean, if you're doing interdisciplinary work, you typically have to work twice as hard. And I think in the case of, of being bold or uh, looking for different formats, I think, I think it really does take a lot of it's a it's kind of a pain in the ass to go if you're you know to try to do something that's different and taking a chance and it's not it's not you know um, it, it takes so much effort that that uh, it can be difficult and draining and demanding but I think I think if um, you have an app class, and I, if I think if you bring a machine that's made out of marbles and wood, I think, I think a professor is, if you put effort into that, that you can really uh, do that in an interesting way. Yeah. 
And I, and I think, and that comes back to taking a chance. Uh, hello, sorry. Um, there's also a question, uh, <coughs> a remark here from the audience. Um, I'm Arthur. I would also appreciate when other uh, speakers from the audience introduce themselves, because I like to know who they are and where they come from. Um, but um, I teach here in, um, in this school, actually, um, in two departments. And what I like, I want to say something positive, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. Um, when I come, you know, when I did my education, art education, 25 years ago or something, in uh, Groningen uh, at the art school, there was nothing there, right? There was nothing there. Art history, for example, was below the level of high school. It was incredibly bad, and you had to do everything yourself. Yeah? When you talk about DIY culture, art education was DIY culture uh, totally, 100%, you had to do everything yourself. I found that totally disappointing. I wanted to leave art school immediately, <laughs> um, having failed all my schools before. But, um, <laughs> but uh, and, and now, a generation uh, along the way, uh, we see here, I compare only this to this school, uh, there's so much on offer in terms of courses. Um, and I'm really um, jealous to the students here what they can do in comparison to 25 years ago. Um, and, but still, there's of course a lot uh, that needs to be improved because I still miss very basic stuff that's not being taught, like psychology, for example, and perception. Why is this not being taught in an article? I'm really surprised by this um, still, until this day. I do one course myself, because out of a need, um, and, I, and it, this is focused on uh, cognitive dissonance uh, theory of Festinger, um, or basically, to teach the, the students the mind fuck. And because I think that's really important. You know, when you want to get your message out, how do you attach an audience uh, with their emotion to your work? And one of the vehicles, of course, can be cognitive dissonance theory. And that can work very well, um, as we have seen. Um, then, I also agree with uh, Garnett about um, looking back into history, um, what has all been done in history. For example, I was just picking up a book that was thrown out here at the library, um, a great book about um, the machine. And in 19th century, they had, for example, the stereo viewer. The way they talk about it is exactly the same as VR now. Mm -hmm. It also failed. That was my last one. Yeah. Okay. So. On that note, uh, yes, uh, we'll thank you. Uh, On a positive you. note, we will <laughs> end exactly. the day. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. All right. Um, thank you.